And good afternoon. Welcome back to The Call to Justice. This is episode five, and we are live from Prince George's County, Maryland, in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. region. It brings me great pleasure to return here in 2024 after a hiatus, very busy fall and winter 2024, and on into now. Welcome back. We have a full slate of all kinds of issues that you have brought to my attention in the intervening months since we were last here in the month of October. We are very pleased to bring you uh, several consumer concerns and reports that we are following intently here in the region and in the country. We also want to update you on some of the matters that we have been following. One of those is, you will recall from October of 2022, the urgent Children's National Hospital concerns that were raised. We now have a whistleblower African-American Christian counselor who has a complaint that has been processed at the DC Office of Human Rights who has revealed extreme discrimination and documented such through recorded uh, information. And we are following that very closely. Stay tuned here to the call to justice to learn more about this public safety and public health risk that is being exposed and unpacked day by day. It is an important year for public policy. We have an election, we have primaries in the spring, and we have a general election in November. It is very important that you follow your moral compass, follow your political instincts, and follow your economic justice mentality in order to put in leadership those persons who reflect uh, justice and decency. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of justice and decency in so many of these cases that we have to address, and we are keeping tabs on. I'm holding the Office of Human Rights um, uh, interaction between the African American male Christian counselor and the persons who have agreed him at Washington Children's National Hospital, and we have a very damning indictment of disparate treatment alleged here at the uh, public Accommodations Enforcer, the D.C. Office of Human Rights. Now, we know the D.C. Office of Human Rights is not without problems. That is the office that uh, Georgia Stewart had to go against after 50 years on staff there from the 70s into the 2010s. She took her case of age discrimination uh, with elements of defamation all the way to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And it was horrible how the system failed Ms. Stewart uh, there's much more to say about that. So we hope and pray that those persons who are going, who have found discrimination based on race, based on sex, uh, perhaps your child in Child Protective Services land got caught up over there in a dragnet of some kind, but we are praying that those persons in charge there will come to their senses and treat our people with the respect and dignity, not only that they deserve the human beings made in the image of God, as we believe as Christians, but also as citizens of a district that has a Human Rights Act of 1977 that is supposed to embody the spirit of unity, the spirit of fairness, the spirit of equitable principles, equality under the law, equality of opportunity, equality of treatment. It's a shame in 2024 when we have to bring lawsuits that address those matters that these entities fail to address short of the heavy hand. And we know that court is not guaranteed. We know that uh, these very well-to-do, I will say wealthy organizations have all the money in the world to even try to manipulate the media. But thank goodness there's a WBGR radio, independent, Christian, and black. And we are unapologetic here. Nobody will stop me from telling the truth to the best of my ability as and backed up by God and by you, the viewers. Keep it coming. Keep dialing. You may call us any time to report on these transgressions. You can find us at thecalltojustice.tv, www.thecalltojustice.tv. And, of course, you are free to find me anywhere online, Amos Jones, uh, and reach me, telephone, email, online contact forms. Don't give up. Uh, many people have told me that they have run into roadblocks technologically when trying to reach out to us to expose these evildoers that we have to come against. But don't give up. You can even call into the show 
if you see no other way. You're welcome during this live hour we have at high noon every Saturday here on WBGR, Believing in God Radio, here on The Call to Justice. So we're watching that. Children's National Hospital, a black counselor uh, with an Office of Human Rights charge processed and moving uh, out into public. We hope and pray that Children's National comes to its senses and does the right thing because of, with this particular complainant, and what they tried to do to him and his license, a Christian counselor and therapist, my goodness, there are probably more where that came from. We are imploring Children's National to get it right. We also have the problems that are coming in, and we see this at the Better Business Bureau of American Home Shield. You may have seen in your inboxes and maybe even on television, advertisements for these home warranty services, American Home Shield. It's a Memphis-based company, and I've investigated American Home Shield, and I'm sorry to report they have a record longer than the Nile River at the uh, Better Business Bureau of policyholders, because it's essentially an insurance product. Uh, a home warranty is a product where you pay a lot of money every month, and you're supposed to, as a consumer, have certain protected items paid for in your home, HVAC, broken toilet, things like that. Um, but unlike many, or like many, all too many aftermarket warranties and service plans, we have a pattern and practice of non-payment of claims and even of framing people as if they broke their own appliances. Uh, the Better Business Bureau rap sheet is a mile long, and it looks like the pattern and practice of American Home Shield is to make you fight them, and then they offer a little bit of money on your repair so that you'll go away. If that's the pattern and practice as wide as it appears to be, if it's that wide as it appears to be at the Better Business Bureau, they're in very big trouble. And I personally have run into this with American Home Shield and refused to settle. So we're looking at American Home Shield, and I encourage you to reach out and let us know so that we can pray that they be convicted. Um, you all, the, the Bible says that the, there's a wide path that people follow, but there's a narrow path that is the path of safety. And uh, one of my favorite YouTube evangelists, Sister Sharon, out of Cleveland, uh, said it best when she warned her audience only eight people walked up onto that ark. And I'm here to tell you what I've seen this week in my practice alone um, has alarmed me to just how people don't seem to respect the just way of God who sits in judgment where you will give an accounting one day. All of the swindling and the lies and the cover-ups and the use of money and power to oppress people, you will pay for that. My paternal grandmother in the, at the height of the civil rights movement down south in Kentucky where we're from saw so many evil principalities at play damning black people particularly so badly that she had to declare in her Christian sensibility that she was convinced that hell was going to be a black ghetto my goodness heavenly father have mercy on them those that spitefully use the, the Negro people here in this country, and it's still going. Uh, the enforcement agencies that don't do their job and that investigate all the wrong people and let the people who are really harming the, the public go right along. That's why you have so many problems. And that brings us to be honest. So we're looking at American Home Shield, so-called home warranties. We have reports now at the city of Alexandria Police Department that they are impounding vehicles without due process of notice to vehicles, people parking vehicles, that they are not giving 72 hours notice of cars parked on streets for 72 hours or more, which of course must be moved under Alexandria's ordinances. This is important because we have a letter in hand of an impounded car, and watch the modus operandi of, of, of the city of Alexandria Police Department, they, they write a certified letter on, this one is May 1st. They mail it out on May 2nd, and in the DC mail, it may get to your house five, seven days later. 
but you're racking up an impoundment fee of $50 a day plus a $215 fee. Uh, they don't give you those schedules directly in the letter. You have to figure it out. This is reported to me. And they announced to claim your vehicle, you must appear at the city impound lot, which is on Eisenhower Avenue in South Alexandria, between 8 a.m. and 6.45 p.m. Monday through Friday. This letter that we have in our possession dated Thursday, May 2nd, says, um, and, and, and for an impounded car from May 1st of 2024, says, you must appear at the impound lot between 8 o'clock a.m. and 6.45 p.m. They're at the City of Alexandria Police Department, Department of Traffic Control at 5249 Eisenhower Avenue. So you go there at, I don't know, 6.25 p.m. and within the window on Friday evening after work, only to find that there are large permanent metal signs that say hours of operation 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Why does the City of Alexandria lie in these letters going out to victimize persons who were not notified these parking tickets that say you've been there for 72 hours and must move under the ordinance are supposed to give you a 72 hour uh, lead time to move your car. But the ticket that we found in their system that was not noticed to this particular owner of the vehicle was there on the same day, May 1st, they placed the ticket and then impounded the car right away. And there were no outstanding tickets other than that one. So not only do you not have 72 hours notice per the ordinance to move your car, but you have no knowledge of the ticket because they whirl your car away while they haven't given you time to get the ticket. And then they, they know that it's going to take several days while they rack up $50 a day to get the letter to you, and then they close an hour and 45 minutes earlier than they claim. This is what I call a racket. How could a city government, Alexandria established in 1749, be that illiterate slash incompetent slash unaware of their constitutional uh, obligations to provide due process to citizens? How did we get here in the nation's capital? And what do they do with what would, that's ill-gotten gains? And so it must be happening to many people where they look up and suddenly owe $650 plus and counting. Oh, and by the way, they're not open on weekends, uh, Saturdays and Sundays. They're closed, but they still charge you uh, for the impoundment. So consumers are very upset. I want to hear from you if you're in Alexandria City and your car was impounded without notice, without ticketing, under the three-day rule. Um, parking on the street for three days, uh, more than 72 hours, a 72-hour rule. So um, if that's the case, we think where there's smoke, there's fire. We wonder why the property clerk, who is listed here in this letter that we have in our custody uh, with a funny signature, there's no name on here to be found. So we're investigating the city of Alexandria Police Department for these um, trumped up uh, and accelerated penalties as unconstitutional for lack of notice and uh, an, un, un, an improper taking. Call us, find us, write to us at the call to justice.tv as soon as you have ascertained that you or a loved one has had an impounded car under the 72 hour rule and you too have been lied to about when you can pick up that car. Five o'clock closing is a lot different from 6.45 p.m. What are working people to do? How can such a woke liberal city council in Alexandria allow a police force to run amok this way? Because that's what it is. It's called running amok. I can prove We're going to invite them on to talk about it. We're going to invite the police chief so that we can have that person to explain this improper policy. We got it on tape, too. We got tape on that one. So stay tuned for that expose in potential uh, action in mass. And then we have... Noticing now problems at the D.C. Attorney Client Arbitration Board, which advertises itself as a fast, efficient service for lawyers and clients who find themselves in fee disputes. And yet I'm holding in my hand um, a nearly three-year running dispute that was before them for roughly two years. 
That's longer than the breach of contract federal lawsuit I filed in federal district court in Maryland in uh, January that was resolved and dismissed within eight weeks. Why is the attorney client arbitration board taking so long to uh, process arbitrations? And, and why do they have all white male panels, one of them led by recently we have learned and reported, we have reported to the authorities that there is a chief arbitrator going around who attended a religious school for years voluntarily and I don't want to defame the religion, and I don't, the truth is not defamation. But I am so sensitive to religious freedom that even if you have a racist religion, like the one I'm about to describe to you, you have a right to have that religion in America. And if you have that right, I have my right to be a devout Martin Luther King, Jimmy Carter Baptist, which I am. Uh, an established, credible, long-standing, powerful faith. That's how we got over. We beat the chains of white Jim Crow racism, the white racist American Bar Association. We overcame, and they were. They barred every black lawyer until the 40s. Shame on the ABA. They need to repent and pay. But this white racist legal system history that we have that's proven, ask the late J. Clay Smith, dean of Howard Law, the author of it, late dean of Howard Law School, former dean, and the author of Emancipation, the making of the black lawyer, really the encyclopedic treatment of histories of black was and all the deep grain 300 year racism and talk about james crow jr esquire uh, the ku klux klan according to alton maddox uh, god rest his soul was organized in a white lawyer's law office no wonder we have a chief white arbitrator with an all white male three panel three arbitrator panel who's a member of this denomination i won't name it's not a christian denomination at all but it has taught until 2013 its teachings on race, not disavowed until 2013, have included that black women and men are barred from participating in the ordinance of its temples necessary for the highest level of salvation. White people, yes. Negroes, no. Did you hear me? The article of faith barred black women and men from participating in temple ordinances necessary for the highest level of salvation. So blacks don't have a soul worthy of saving. That means that black men in particular were disfavored because this is also a religion that allows only men to be in leadership. It's an all male priesthood, this religion, non-Christian religion, large religion, but not Christian and we have a chief white arbitrator coming from a school infused with this religious heritage where black people are nothing compared to whites. That's just the right and right. It. And this is a person the attorney client arbitration board thinks that it's supposed to place in charge. My goodness. My goodness. Um, there's a lot coming out on that in the D.C. Superior Court. And we owe it to the public in the interest of public safety and whistleblowing on these principalities. That D.C. Attorney Client Arbitration Board, you need to stop with this second-class treatment of black attorneys and black clients. Justice delayed is justice denied. You need to stop it. You know you're wrong, and names are being named. Time is up. This is about public safety and public interest and you're in the wrong. And somebody has to tell the truth about it who really knows the rules of arbitration and the rules of racial conduct and the rules of this low-down so-called religion that this white man went and studied at this school that had those views until 2013, they were disavowed. And before that, there was some kind of revelation in 1978. What a horrible dastard. Dirty and low down, all white motif. How could anybody voluntarily associate with a school for four years that does that? And what does a person like with an all white law office in Fairfax, this, this, this arbitrator, and you're putting him in the District of Columbia over African Americans? 
we need to look at that because what what that person has done um, it needs to be re reversed it needs to be reversed and we need to look very hard at that and if the authorities won't do it we will right here on the call to justice in the name of Jesus this is a television ministry the prophet Amos in the Bible exposed unjust judges and crooked ministers it's time to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth name by name by name by name by name office by office by office by office by office by name court by court by court by court by court by name time is up we're looking at MedStar hospital and litigation indicating that a white Prince George's County Southern Maryland Hospital physician's assistant has been according to a judge in Prince George's County State Court engaged in what the judge called a deplorable practice of racial profiling in COVID black men go to the ER needing help white physician assistant supervisor looks them up on the internet why to see whether they have criminal records every black man why 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 so much so that a white judge here in Prince George's County weeks ago declared that act deplorable. And the black female physician's assistant who reported it got dismissed for reporting it and based on her race. A mixed case. But for her whistleblowing, but for her blackness, she would not have been retaliated against for whistleblowing, for blackness, and dismissed she alleges in her federal lawsuit. We're going to bring the, the whistleblowing victim of race discrimination, all of that, we're going to bring her story to light in the coming episodes. It's very unfortunate. And guess what? This is a physician assistant who took this dismissal to the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in Baltimore, which found cause, probable cause, extremely rare finding at the EEOC for those of you who never contended with that agency. And this time, MedStar was found to have committed acts that led the government to declare probable cause that there was race discrimination in employment and retaliation in employment of this stalwart African-American wife, mother of three, physician assistant who in COVID Served the public in scrubs. Her daughters couldn't even hug her when she would get home. She was a frontline medical service personnel. And MedStar dismissed her. And now they're fighting her in court. They have accused that black woman of everything of being a child of God. Shame on MedStar. We're asking them to repent. And it's, it's, it's popping in the federal court. It's popping. And then, finally today, there's the problem of GEICO Insurance, which is a, a company I have found to be a fine insurer. But we don't know what on earth is going on with the diminished value department that has given a runaround this diminished value department including the executive office complaints line to another whistleblower on Geico, whom we will pseudonymously term Cora. And we have Cora live on the line to talk about Stephen Huber, Nicholas Rosinski, Joseph Gilo, Jennifer Donisic, what on earth is going on where a diminished value claim has taken how long, Cora, on the line? Cora, you're on the line. You are amped on speaker. Cora, how long have you been in this your car got bashed, beautiful, nearly brand new, months old Chevrolet Volt, 
dashed on the bridge coming into Washington by Geico's insured. Therefore, diminished value of her vehicle is in order. Geico hasn't paid a dime. And they've begun ignoring the lawyer, this lawyer. Cora, under pseudonym, tell us about your ordeal and how you haven't been paid a dime for the diminished value, despite the number of times you've been to the repair shop they kept sending you to who messed up your car. Tell us the story. Um, hi, Amos. How are you? It's good so, to hear your voice, Cora. I'm fine. <laughs> Welcome to WBGR. Thank you. So basically, the accident happened on August 2023. I, my car is brand new, as you stated. Um, I have to take I have to take my car to the shop um, about five times, and um, they they will keep lying about the, um, the fixes. And every time I go there, I will find issues and actually more issues because they damaged my car while it was waiting at the shop or All while they were working leaves, on yes, it. Yes, they leave your you know they, your car winds up in these body shops, often coming out worse than it went in, other than the beat up part. Yeah, the doors, the windows were scratched, and the, there was dents, and the tires, the, the rear camera, and then it was full of dust and dirt inside my car. The, the, this the stereo brand system Chevrolet, got damaged. dirt and yes. dust. Just how low? How low? I'm sorry, Cora. Yeah. Continue. Yeah, so basically, and... I followed their direction when the accident happened. They told me that I should take my car to their shop they work with. And then that will, they promised me for the smooth and stress-free process. And it, they say everything can be fixed quickly, but it turned out a big, big nightmare. It was months of stress and problems. And their caseworker was supposed to handle the case, but I was actually being, going back and forth between them the shop between the Geico case workers sending them emails, calling them, and it, it was just, it's it's been a, a lot of stress for me and disappointment, basically. Complete disappointment. How many times were you sent back to this insurance company selected body shop? And your car um, still isn't right, but how many times over roughly how many months were you? Five times. I also have to take it to inspection, um, so I will say six times. And there was a diminished value process, and was your car ever observed by uh, the insurance company to provide your uh, amount of money you should get for diminished value? And diminished value audience is the... When you have a late model, very newer type car that gets hit, it can never be certified pre-owned again and other things. Mm -hmm. So there's something called a diminished value. It's mm -hmm. worth less than it was. Yeah. And the job of the insurance company is to look at that and pay a claim. Um, Cora? Yes. Were you given a value? Yeah, they, they. It was like a joke. It was very little value they gave me, and and the considering the the damage my car has, that I still have to fix it. It will cost a lot more than they offer to give me. And if I have to sell my car, I will probably have nothing in my hand, basically. I mean, yes, this brand new car shame. is you, bec you... become like worthless something. So... It, it whistles when I'm driving it. <laughs> So you have followed the processes, and you've yet right. to be paid. Now, you've been using me to try to elicit a fair payment, including for the runaround, which is what you've been given, and the fact that your car is not repaired to the original shape. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a shame. And we're calling on these persons, especially uh, Jennifer Donisic. Let's get this resolved. I mean, are there other people out there in WBGR land who've had this problem? Let us know. Uh, contact us at thecalltojustice.tv. We thank you, Cora, for your time this thank afternoon. You. It's very important thank that you come forward the way you, you have. You're a, a brave And woman. just one last thing before I ha you know, leave the show. Um, I was all also blamed for the issues happened by the, their, their shop. They're saying that I, I could take my car to somewhere else. And I actually followed, so I was blamed for following their directions. Framed. You were blamed and framed. And that's what happened to me with American Home Shield Home Warranty. Um, uh, 
they claim that there was a hairline crack on a 17 year old toilet for excessive force. Um, I am not overweight at all, and never really have been. Uh, and uh, also, that toilet is in my guest bathroom that's never used. And when the repairman from American Home Shield came the first time, he said, oh, it's fixed because he didn't see the crack. There was just a slight amount of water that would drip. And after a few days, it would be, you know, enough to be in the crevice of the tile, the ceramic tile. And I knew that that's not supposed wow. to happen. So he came back the next day and then declared, oh, there is a hairline. That's what it is. I didn't fix it. And then he gave the reason excessive force. What excessive force? I found out that old toilets, that happens to What's the point of a home warranty? that you pay all this money into when they lie. Just yeah. lies. Yeah. And I refuse to True. accept the settlement that you've been offered a, you know, a settlement of diminished value. No. We will have to do a class action. Bad faith. And I'm getting the federal regulatory officials involved in the FTC. What a shame. Jennifer Donisic, Stephen Huber, Nicholas Rosinski, Joseph Gilo, you're invited onto this air. You are invited here to explain this 30 pages of communication on behalf of Cora. You owe her. You need to pay. Geico. And I thank you, Cora. Goodbye. We've got a lot on our plate. It's a very difficult path. Too many people are having to fight too hard and to spend too much time to make too many people do the right thing after the people did the wrong thing in the first place. From Geico to American Home Shield to the DC Attorney Client Arbitration Board to the City of Alexandria Police Department to the DC Office of Human Rights to Washington Children's National Hospital to MedStar. What on earth is going on? Why is there so much misfeasance, nonfeasance, malfeasance, and racism and bias on the part of these powerful entities. When are we going to get it together as a people in this country? I pray for the day when we can rejoice that justice is rolling down and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Today it's anything but. Shame on all of you who do wrong by these people and force them to have to go legal and still do wrong intransigently and press your luck in these courts and these panels, many of which seem to be corrupt morally, challenged legally, and bankrupt ethically. And I can prove it. Names are being made. Time is up. That's a wrap for us this week. We thank you for tuning in. We must get back into the vineyard and into the realm of solving people's problems, standing up for righteousness' sake, and telling it out so that you might have a smoother existence, at least as a consumer and certainly as a citizen and a fellow American. I thank you for tuning in. God bless you and yours, and happy upcoming Mother's Day. We look forward to Episode 6, where we will look at, among other issues, the wonderful work of the Legal Accountability Project. The Legal Accountability Project, founded by Aliza Schatzman, is making great strides in what I do, and that is exposing the moral infirmities and the manifest injustices that those in power inflict on people. She's a stalwart attorney who is exposing judges, judges who treat their clerks like dirt. If you'll treat a clerk like dirt, how do you treat an indigent litigant or a civil rights lawyer trying to work on behalf of people alone in the name of public service? My goodness, where is the integrity? So you look up the Legal Accountability Project and their great work. I'm not the only one out here going where no other lawyer will go uh, out of a sense of obligation and a profound offense taken at injustice anywhere, which Dr. King told us is the threat a threat to justice everywhere. God bless you and yours. Keep your hand in God's hand, and we will meet again. Goodbye.